Hi, I'm Sally Britton, and I'm here from the Sweet Regency Romance Fans Facebook group to give you your first chapter Friday. Today's first chapter will be from my upcoming book, Reforming Lord Neil. This book will be released by the end of May, hopefully. Chapter 1, August 1815. Many in Suffolk County doubtless enjoyed a summer's rain. Teresa Clapham, however, heard the first drops upon her window and bit her lip in an attempt to keep from crying. Even alone in her small bed, in the sparsely furnished upstairs room, she could not make a sound. It would not do for her mother in the room next door, nor her daughter across the hall, to hear sounds of her distress. Not when they depended upon her to remain composed and cheerful. The roof needed repair. If that was the least of her troubles, the rain might be shrugged off and ignored for a time, but it was one of a hundred things that needed her attention. She wouldn't need to rise for another several hours, around the same time the sun would come up from the sea. If she roused too early, she would wake the other occupants of the house and throw everyone's day into confusion. Teresa pulled in a deep, shuddering breath. If she gave into tears, she would give herself a headache. That would only make the day ahead more miserable. But breathing slowly, while counting backward from 100 in French, would calm her. At least she hoped it would. It usually helped her calm her worries. It usually helped her relax. Then she heard the first drops fall into the bucket she kept in the corner of the, her room. The water hitting the thin metal made a harsh tapping sound which echoed through the quiet. The leak had grown worse. A month ago, it could rain fully half an hour before a single drop came through the roof, but her tears did not come. The heavens did enough weeping, and she need not add to it. French numbers weren't doing her very much good, but perhaps counting in another language might help. Her Spanish could always use improvement. When she would need to actually speak Spanish again, she had no idea, but the modern languages were important, and she must keep up if she were to teach Caroline. The dripping kept pulling her mind away from counting and away from sleep. Finally, she gave up and rose from her bed, her bones sounding an alarm from her sudden movements. Were the bones of a 30-year-old woman supposed to creak? Creaking along with her personal structure were the ropes which held the mattress. They must need tightening. She would have to remember where she put the mattress key for that particular chore. Her bare feet eased onto the wood floor, she felt about for her worn bedroom slippers, but abandoned the effort after a moment. Most likely, Caroline had borrowed them. Though only eleven years old, Caroline had grown alarmingly over the spring and could very nearly wear her mother's shoes comfortably. The child certainly outgrew her own shoes faster than Teresa managed to purchase new pairs. Yet another thing to add to her list. Caroline needed new boots soon unless Teresa gave in at last and let the girl spend the rest of summer barefoot. With a shawl around her shoulders, Teresa left her room as quietly as possible. Then she went down the uncarpeted corridor, down the narrow staircase, and to the back of the house where the kitchen might offer her some distraction. A light beneath the kitchen doorway gave her pause. Then she pushed the door open on its whining hinge. Perhaps there was oil in the barn she might use to silence that sound. Mother sat at the table, white cap upon her head, shawl around her shoulders, and her hands wrapped around a teacup. Louisa Godwin smiled through the lamplight at Teresa. What woke you? she asked in a hushed tone. The rain or the bucket? The rain. Teresa shared her mother's tired smile. May I join you, Mother? Of course. Pre-dawn tea parties are never enjoyable without company. Mother nodded to the teapot on the table. The tea things did not belong on a table so old or in a kitchen so humble. The set had belonged to Teresa when her life had consisted of beautiful, delicate things. The cups, saucers, plates, teapot, and the other trappings sprayed with pink rosebuds had been a wedding gift from her late husband. Teresa poured herself a cup of herbal tea. They could not afford real tea, tea leaves. But dandelions, rose hips, Chamomile, every herb they could gather and dry themselves, had been tried and tested in various combinations, sweetened with honey instead of sugar, accompanied with milk on occasion. It was simple fare, but enough. 
When Teresa settled across the table from her mother, cup in hand, she released a deep sigh. It will be a long day for both of us now. Mother shrugged. We will come through it fine, I dare say. Despite her 50 years, Teresa's mother still held herself with grace, and she retained beauty in her maturity. Her frame was neither spare nor plump. The only wrinkles near her eyes and at the very corners of her mouth were from years of smiling. And though the silver strands had increased their appearance in her black hair, nothing quite gave away her age. We always do, Teresa sipped at her tea, listening to the wind and rain. She shivered and pulled her shawl tight with her free hand. I need to find a way to get the roof repaired. I thought I would wait until the end of summer, but the leak seems to be growing the longer I leave it undone. After a thoughtful nod, Mother added, There is that leak in the barn, too. That could cause problems when we bring hay in for the winter. How their lives had changed. Teresa used to be a creature of the moment, never worrying after winter rain and snow while summer was still underway. But over the course of two years, the first living under the grudging charity of her brother-in-law, and the second in her inherited cottage, Teresa had adapted. The kitchen door made its awful squeal again, and Teresa turned to see Caroline standing there, wearing Teresa's slippers. It's raining, Caroline said, lingering just outside the room as though uncertain of her welcome. Teresa exchanged a knowing smile with her mother. Come in, dear, have some tea. Caroline's eyes brightened in the darkness and she hurried forward. Thank you. She retrieved a mug from one of the shelves. Teresa felt the familiar softening of her heart when she saw how easily her daughter reached what had, a year ago, been too tall a shelf for her. Caroline, she said, and her daughter turned with mug in hand. Take a teacup. It is a special occasion. It is? Caroline sounded surprised, but quickly did as she was bid. She settled in a chair next to her grandmother. What occasion? With a laugh, Teresa pushed aside her worries for the moment. Her daughter needed sunshine amid the hardships they faced. The occasion of us all waking up far earlier than we should. Let us hope such occasions are rare in the future, her mother said. But if you will fetch some bread and jam, granddaughter, we can have a little celebration. Small joys kept them all hopeful of better days, though Teresa saw none on the horizon. Hours later, when the teacups were drained several times over and the rain had finally stopped, Teresa went out, wearing a dress that had once been blue as the summer sky, but had faded to a more gray color. Teresa went to milk their old dairy cow. Milking a cow. What would her late husband think if he saw her perform the undignified chore? Yet every time she sat on the three-legged milking stool, Teresa offered up a prayer of gratitude for the animal and the farmer's daughter who had taught her how to go about milking. After that chore, she went to weed their summer garden, leaving her shoes off rather than coat them in mud. It was easier to clean her feet than scrub at mud cake shoes. Gulls had already been and gone, first picking at the bugs that had come out to nibble on cabbages and vines and then making their journey to the sea. It had surprised her to see such large birds take notice of her little garden. Yet she expressed her thanks for them, too. The smaller birds were still hopping about, finding tinier creatures that threatened carrot leaves and chamomile petals. By the time she finished there, Caroline had already fed their six chickens and gathered a basket full of eggs. Teresa wiped the line of sweat from her brow and walked to the fence separating her property from the road. Though tired, she ducked beneath the long rail and started up the path. It curved over a hill, then turned eastward and upward, taking her above the sea. Dunwich lay to the south of where she stood. All Saints Church Tower, crumbly as it was, poked up from the cliff. She shuddered at the tower and turned her face to the east, where the sun rose steadily. We will make it through today, she said quietly, and this week, and this month, and this summer. We can make it through winter. They had already done it once. Yet even as she spoke, lifting her hopes and eyes heavenward, a weight dragged at her heart. Her meager income would barely keep them alive. How would she find a way to pay for repairs, for any help at all? If she were a man, it would be enough. A man could climb atop thatched roofs to repair them, till more ground than she could, swing a hammer with greater efficiency, 
chop wood, and do all manner of things she had to hire out. But if she were a man, she would not be in her predicament. She would have inherited from her father, for one thing. She would have never married, and thus kept the 8,000 pounds of her portion away from her husband. The familiar anger surged, quickly replaced by guilt. I am not angry at you, Henry, she said softly to the sea. I only wish you had told me that I had some warning. She had never even suspected her husband had a weakness for cards. He had treated her with such tenderness and love. There had never been anything to make her worry over his conduct nor their marriage. Her brother-in-law's tale of all the debts accumulated after her husband's death had nearly shattered her good memories of Henry. She could not imagine her husband stealing the funds that ought to have supported her and Caroline upon his untimely death. She wiped away tears for the second time that day. Squaring her shoulders, she forced a smile. Likely, had anyone seen, she knew they would find it a rather grim expression. Man or no man, she would find a way to make every farthing count. They would be warm and well-fed come winter, somehow. Thanks for listening to me read my first chapter of Reforming Lord Neal. This book will be out May 2020, and I hope you'll grab a copy. I also hope that you will come and join us for other First Chapter Fridays. Have a lovely day.